Welcome to this online lesson on London in the Second World War. This lesson is titled Cover-Ups and Disasters. Why were key events not reported? The aims are to know some of the key disaster events of World War II. Secondly, to explain why events were not always reported. And thirdly, to evaluate the usefulness of sources. As a do now task, all newspapers in the UK in World War II were subject to censorship. This meant that the government who could control to a certain extent what news, newspapers reported on. Firstly, why might local newspapers, in London for example, have struggled to censor this information? And secondly, how would censorship affect people's trust in the media? Pause the video now while you attempt those tasks. Alright, what have we come up with? We'll look at the photograph. This is one of the famous events we're going to be looking at later on. It was a V2 attack on Deptford. Now let's imagine that the local newspaper in Deptford hadn't reported on this. That might seem a bit ridiculous given that people could simply walk out onto their streets or even look out of their broken windows and see the damage. They could literally see the damage with their own eyes and yet the newspaper would might say nothing about it and just re uh, report on local other news, marriages, births and deaths, etc. So how would censorship affect people's trust in the media? Well, if they could see devastation around them that wasn't being reported on, they might wonder what else wasn't being reported on by these, these newspapers. But then in the absence of very little other media with which to go on, what choice did people have? So I suspect that most people trusted the media as far as they could, realising that the demands of the war meant that not everything would or could be reported on. Let's continue by looking at one of the key concepts. Propaganda. Censorship is where certain facts or entire stories are covered up and hidden. This is part of the wider idea of propaganda. The purposes of government propaganda were as follows. To keep people's morale or happiness high. To encourage people to act as the government wanted, e.g. the carrying of gas masks. To highlight the importance of the war effort, e.g. collecting scrap metal or growing their own food. Anti-spy security. And to win support from other countries. Your task then, summarise the purpose of propaganda and then which element of propaganda would you, would you expect to be most valued by the government? Here's some examples of propaganda. What you're going to do now is you're going to match each of these posters to one of the purposes of propaganda which have included in the pink box on the right. As an extension, explain how the poster intended to have the effect it, that you identified. For example, how did it keep morale high? Pause the video now and have a go at linking the posters to the purposes of morale. There are five posters and five purposes, so there should be one for each. Poster number one, United we are strong, united we will win. This poster shows guns firing, presumably at the enemy, and shows the flags of many of the allied countries. Britain, the USA and the USSR are particularly prominent at the front, as is China, that's the red flag with the sort of sun design on it, Australia, the Netherlands, Mexico even is behind Great Britain, Mexico had a small but quite interesting role in World War II, Norway and several others. So that one really is all about winning support from other countries. Two is a really famous poster, it has since been reproduced and kind of adopted by the current generations, and yet it wasn't very popular at the time. But keep calm and carry on is all about keeping morale high. Three, Hitler will send no morning, so always carry your gas mask, is to encourage people to act as the government wanted. In this case, the carrying of gas masks. Think about more recent times where government slogans have been encouraged to keep people indoors during the coronavirus outbreak in 2020. They have a very similar purpose. Simple messages with a simple effect that people can really understand. Fourthly, we've got the kitchen waste one. Pig food. Keep it dry, free from glass, bones, tins, etc. It also feeds poultry. Your council will collect. Well, this highlights the importance of the war effort and how individuals can still make a, an important contribution to the wider effort. For example, the collecting of scrap metal and the growing of their own food. And lastly, by a process of elimination, but also from the content, this one is all about anti-spy security. A photograph of two people kissing, presumably as the serviceman is off away. I know where he's going, the woman says to the man in the hat. They talked, and then this happened. He got bombed by a German bomber. 
careless talk costs lives, was one of the more famous propaganda slogans of the war. We're now going to consider the censoring of disasters. In a previous lesson, we considered the censoring of the South Hallsville school disaster, which killed 600 people. If you've not seen that lesson, I urge you to go and have a look at it. Disasters do happen in war. This is a sad fact of what they are. So, having considered the South Hallsville school disaster, the government reacted by saying that 77 people had been killed. In reality, probably nearer 600 had been killed. Censorship of disasters served two main purposes. Firstly, the stopping of the Germans finding out how effective their bombing was, and therefore you didn't want to encourage them to do even more of it. And secondly, preserving civilian morale so that people wouldn't give up. Question 5. Which of these purposes do you think was most important? Choose your purpose and explain why. Pause the video now while you do that. Question 6. Rumours spread despite censorship. Why might rumours be a bigger problem than the real story? After that we're going to go on to a research task. So complete question 6 first, then press play when you went to see the instructions for the research task. OK, here's how the research task is going to work. Task 1 we will be to record the following information for each of the disasters that we're going to have a look at. The name and date of the event, where it happened, what caused it, what actually happened, and how did the government respond. Remember, for example, you'll need to include the numbers uh, killed in what happened. After we've looked at all of them, for each disaster, which purpose of censorship most applies? Is it to stop the Germans finding out how effective their bombing has been, or to preserve civilian morale? And remember, it's which one most applies. So if both, both apply, choose the one which is still most important. What I suggest you do is that you make three sets of blank notes for task one. Add those headings. Add leave space for a, a, a title, so for the name and date of the event. And repeat that three times. Once you've prepared to take your notes, on the next screens you're going to see the information about those disasters and you can start filling in what you need to do. So, prepare your notes now and pause the video. When you're ready, press play and we'll have a look at disaster number one. Disaster number one, the Balam Tube Disaster. On October the 14th, 1940, people filled the underground ticket office at Balam Underground Station in Balam, London. This underground ticket office uh, was underneath the road at the intersection of three streets. A German bomber dropped a 1,000 kilogram parachute mine, which exploded on the street directly above the station. The street caved into the ticket office below, obliterating, crushing and suffocating the people in the ticket office. The official record says that 66 people were killed, but historians are unsure because of the number of people who may have been blown to bits by the bomb. The government chose not to release the news to Londoners, but they did publish a photograph in the USA to show the effects of the bombing. That photograph, which was a colour photograph in its original form, is shown at the top right. We're now going to have a look at a source which gives more detail of the damage that was done. For example, the complete collapse of the street also broke uh, several water and sewage uh, services, which flooded the station and indeed flooded the lower levels where people were taking shelter. From the memories of Bert Woolridge, an ARP warden, that means Air Raid Precautions warden, on duty in Balham on the night of the disaster. This is from a TV interview that was recorded in 1985, so a long time after the event. Well, as I went into the entrance, hundreds of people were racing out in real panic. I got to the bottom of the stairs and the entrance to the platform was blocked. All you could hear was the sound of screaming and running water. We managed to get the platform by wading through the sludge on the track. Oh, it was terrible. People were lying there, all dead, and there was a great pile of sludge on top of them. Lots were curled up in sleeping positions on the platform. We put the people on the stretchers and carried them away through the water. I don't think we found any survivors that night. Pause the video now and make any notes that you need to. OK, when you're ready, we'll move on to disaster number two. The Bethnal Green disaster. In some ways, this is the most tragic of the lot. You'll soon see why. By the time of this disaster, Londoners were well used to bombing. But on the 3rd of March 1943, a very different tragedy occurred. 
By this time, only 200 to 300 people regularly used Beth Bethnal Green station, Underground Station as an air raid shelter, down from the 7,000 who sheltered there earlier in the war in 1940-41. to 41. However, as the news had reported a, a heavy RAF attack on Germany, people were nervously waiting to see the revenge raid from the Luftwaffe. When the sirens went off, 1,500 people had already got into the shelter when a new type of anti-aircraft rocket was fired. Wartime secrecy meant that people didn't know what they were. They panicked and ran down the station stairs. A mother carrying a baby tripped and fell at the bottom of the stairs. This caused others to fall over on top of one another. People behind could not see the crush and kept on rushing in, adding to the crush. 173 people were crushed to death and not a single one of them was hurt by bombs. Let's take a look at the modern picture of the entrance to Bethnal Green tube station, which includes a memorial plaque above it. Notice how the stairs make a right angled turn. This meant that the people at the top of these stairs would not have been able to see the crush forming at the bottom. It's worth noting that that central set of uh, railings did not exist at this time. Had they done so, they would have caused a bit of a buffer and something for people to hang onto during the crush. And indeed, the reason that such railings exist is for that purpose. The government brought in some basic measures to control crowds coming into the station, but the story was covered up and censored, so few people heard about it. That there was almost no pressure to prevent another such disaster afterwards. Have a look at Source A that relates to this disaster. Dr Joan Martin describes treating victims from Bethnal Green disaster as part of a BBC article from 2016. We had hardly finished changing the beds before the first wet mauve body was carried into the hospital. Wet because apparently they, were pulled, they pulled the bodies from the shelter. All they did was to dump them on the pavement and throw water on them. Mauve because they were all asphyxiated. They continued to arrive until 11 o'clock that night. At least 30 bodies, mostly women and children almost all dead. Pause the video now and make any notes that you need to. Disaster number three, the Deptford disaster. On November the 25th, 1944, a V2 rocket landed on Woolworths department store at New Cross, Deptford, London. It was a lunchtime rush hour, so the shop and streets were both crammed with shoppers. 167 people, mostly women and children, were killed. Rescuers were still digging out survivors and bodies 24 hours later. A picture of this operation is shown on the right. The government chose not to release details of the disaster until April 1945, a couple of weeks before the end of the war. Our best description of this is given by Bob Street and the source below. It's worth bearing in mind as well that remember there was no warning of the V2s. Bob Street remembers the V2 attack on Deptford. He was speaking in 1994 as a, part, a series of events remembering the 50th anniversary of the disaster. I was eight years old. That morning my mother said that we would meet in Woolworths. The V2 exploded. I heard someone saying, it's Woolworths. And I can remember distinctly saying, my mum's up there. And this chap said, well you better get up there then son. I started to run up the hill. My mother was running down the hill trying to get back to where she last saw me. We were on opposite corners of Batavia Road, but we couldn't see each other for the dust and the muck that was flying about. It was only that we were calling out to each other we were able to find each other. We went straight home. No windows were left, the doors were all open. That's the only time during the war I remember my mother actually crying. Like everyone else, she'd just about had enough. She'd gone into the baker's and the lady she had been with carried on and was dead outside Kennedy's. When my mum came out the baker's, she saw bits of bodies fall on her all over the place. Later that evening, my mum's sister came saying, had mum seen her daughter? She went to Woolworths with her three friends and they never found any of them. All they found was a bit of her identity card to the, to the steps of the church and her sister recognised a hair slide. That's all they ever found. Pause the video now and take any notes that you need to. OK, once you've completed the other tasks that were mentioned earlier, it's time to have a look at uh, the decision to censor certain information and not others. Jot down a quick content, own knowledge and purpose of each of these sources. Source A, a picture of Oldwich Underground Station, closed for trains but opened as a shelter. 
This was published in a British magazine in 1940, during the height of the Blitz. And source B, a picture of the Balham tube disaster, which we looked at earlier. This was published in an American magazine in 1940 as part of an article about the Blitz. Review the government propaganda aims of the time from earlier in the lesson. Which aims apply to each image? Explain your choices. Why was Source A published in the UK but not Source B? As an extension, why might Source B have been published in the USA but not in Britain? Pause the video now while you attempt those tasks. Okay, first of all, the content that you should have got from Source A is that there are people lying all over the floor and it's all very ordered. There's a washing line with people's belongings drying and there's an orderly row of coats on hooks on the wall. There doesn't seem to be any panic. The content of Source B shows an iconic London red bus fallen into the crater left by the parachute mine that caused the Balham tube disaster. Remember that crater that is the one that once would have been the ticket office at Balham tube station. What about the own knowledge? Well, we should know that the underground was used as uh, were, underground stations, sorry, were used as uh, air raid shelters from later on in 1940 until the end of the war. We should also have some information about the Balham tube disaster, how many people were killed, and the circumstances of what happened. And in terms of the purpose, well, it is likely that Source A was published as a way of making the Londoners look very orderly and well behaved, and to encourage other people to act in the same way. Source B, on the other hand, is all about trying to get people to, um, or rather, to trying to get the Americans to support the British. So it's about securing support for other countries. That also helps us answer question two. Question three, well, I suspect that Source A would be published in the UK as a way of encouraging people to stay calm and to behave in the same way that these people in Aldwych are. On the other, Source B might be published in the USA because it's got the iconic London red bus that Americans would have recognised as a symbol of London. And it may have elicited sympathy from the Americans for what was happening to ordinary Londoners during the Blitz. Once you've finished, let's move on. Finally, review the government propaganda aims from earlier. To keep morale high. To encourage people to act as the government wanted. To highlight the importance of the war effort anti-spy security, and to win support from other countries. Based upon these aims, can the censoring of disasters like those we've studied be justified? Those being the Balham Chew disaster, the Bethnal Green Crush disaster, and the Deptford V2 disaster. Secondly, how effective does government censorship appear to be? And lastly, how effective overall is propaganda? Pause this video now and consider your answers. For the first question, I'll leave that up to your point of view. It's a bit of a moral dilemma, dilemma this. Censorship does have an important role in success in the war, but also necessarily involves dishonesty on the part of the government. Within a democracy, this is hardly a healthy thing to do. Secondly, how effective does government censorship appear to have been? Well. Many of these disasters were not, in fact, identified during the war, so people really didn't hear about them. Remember that word did not travel in the same way back then as it does now. There was no social media or mobile communications with, order, with which to, uh, to send messages to each other. More than that, sending letters about these things were also themselves subject to censorship, and the government would be reading the letters of people who, were sent, um, who sent letters from particular areas where these disasters happened. So how effective was propaganda? Pretty effective. Many people got on board with these government ways of doing things, and the war effort was supported. Moreover, these disasters were not reported on. Perhaps one of the more tragic images that I've shown you in this lesson is the one on the, in the bottom right. This shows workmen making repairs to the entrance to Bethnal Green Tube Station. Can you see the row down the middle of the steps there? They're about to fit in the, those railings. If only they'd been fitted there before. But it's easy to be wise after the event. So, on that note and taking some appreciation for the disasters suffered by Londoners in World War II, we'll conclude the lesson there. Thanks for watching. I hope that you found that valuable. And when, when you, uh, if you are able to, please like this video and subscribe to the channel too. Thanks very much, and I'll see you for some more content soon. Goodbye.